for its military output, and this is the core of the problem. Now let me bring this right home to you uh, very, very quickly. I use what I call the bullet example. This is a bullet. It's, it's been fired. It, no one, it has a, a back end on it which has a propellant charge, but it gives you an idea of, of how you can pin this thing down. A bullet has a jacket, which uh, this one happens to be cupro-nickel, copper and nickel, and it has a little back end of it which has a propellant, which is normally nitrocellulose. All right, take the nitrocellulose first. And most men, by the way, get killed by bullets or shells, which are just big versions of this. Where, 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 does it, where, do, where do the Soviets get the nitrocellulose? Well, it's a national suicide. I've got the names of the companies. DuPont, Hercules Powder Company. And the Hercules Powder Company knew that the plant they were putting in was for military purposes because in the State Department files I found their letter in which they said they hoped they'd get permission to ship it even though it had military potential. Uh, I've given you in National Suicide a list of the ammunition used in Vietnam. I've given you the propellants used, whether it's uh, tubular cellulose, uh, the different types of nitrocellulose. And I tell you in there where they get the nitrocellulose from. In other words, you can pin this thing precisely back to, Hugh, to Hercules Powder Company and, and the DuPont Company. The front end of this thing is, is basically copper and nickel. The nickel technology uh, comes essentially from the International Nickel Company, and in my second volume, Western Technology, that, that is pretty well shown. Their copper mines were developed, by, as a matter of fact, by a Los Angeles company, Southwest Engineering Company which used to be, I think, down on uh, Figueroa Street. They went in in the 1930s and developed their mines. So anyway, you can take a thing like a bullet. I could go on just on a bullet for a couple of hours, but we just don't have that time. You can trace this back precisely to a Western origin. Now, this is the core of the problem. You cannot separate industrial technology from military technology. It's, it's, it's intimately integrated. Now, when you sell to West Germany or Great Britain or Australia, you don't worry whether the product has any military application because these countries have no hostile intent. And intent is the major word. What is Soviet intent? you first got to look at that. If it's peaceful, then it doesn't matter. You can ship them machine guns. It doesn't matter. If it's hostile, then you don't ship them anything. You just leave them alone. Now, back in 1968, this was the position I was in, to pick up my story again. We had a war going in Vietnam, which was being supplied by the Soviets. We had an administration in Washington that was repeating the 50-year myth of peaceful trade, and I've shown here a brief history of this 50-year myth. In other words, Washington was stoking up the war indirectly. It was shipping into the Soviet Union, the Soviets were using this technology to manufacture arms going to Vietnam, completing the circle, coming back and killing Vietnamese and Americans. Let me give you a couple of examples. The American pilots over the Ho Chi Minh Trail, they made comments that the Soviet trucks run by the North Vietnamese look like American trucks. They look like Ford trucks. What the American pilots didn't know was that they were Ford trucks made by Gorky. Gaz is the, is the symbol. Gaz 69, there was a whole series of, of, of model numbers with that prefix. Gorky was built by the Ford Motor Company. The equipment has been co consistently brought up to date since the 1930s. And what worried me very much was in 1971, while Gorky trucks were on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, I could trace a shipment out of a New York company going into the Gorky plant, more machinery. In other words, I could precisely identify, even without government information, because obviously I don't get that past a certain point, I can precisely identify the circle. You stoke it up at one end, it comes back and hits you at the other, and you wonder why you can't stop the war. Of course you can't stop the war. The more you stoke it up, the more they're going to keep it going. So in 1971, I could see that, w that there was a very real problem here, I suspected that uh, perhaps my volume three, I didn't know, I suspected that perhaps it was going to be held up. In 1971, I wrote to the Department of Defense. And I said, will you declassify enough files 
for me to write one or two volumes giving the military version of my three-volume economic study, a sequel to the Stanford series. I received a reply right away asking for a list of the files, and I went right back. Mostly I asked for Russian technical manuals, uh, Russian reports. They've got all this stuff. Nothing secret. Didn't want anything later than 1965. I can figure out the rest of it. I didn't want anything on lasers or anything esoteric. Just the bread and butter weapons, tanks, aircraft, this kind of thing. I heard nothing. I waited five months because I knew what they were up to. All they wanted to know was how I was going to go about doing it. I waited five months. I wrote them a little letter. What are you going to do about it? They said nothing. You can be the judge because I, repre I reprinted the correspondence with the Department of Defense. My first letter was to Melvin Laird as Appendix A of National Suicide. And you can judge for yourself my correspondence with the Department of Defense. So that was my position, middle of 1972. Obviously, I wasn't going to get very much assistance to write the military version. I sensed, I had no proof, I had sensed that uh, this was not going to be a particularly welcome study. Then I had an opportunity, American Conservative Union called me and said, you want to go to Miami Beach and give 15 minutes testimony? I said, yes. This was a surprise, I think, because for 10 years I kept away from everybody. I only very recently started to, to emerge. I wanted to complete the thing before I emerged. I went to Miami Beach, subcommittee number seven. I made a statement, no questions. The only meeting I've ever had in my life where I had no questions. And I can tell if an audience is hostile or not, and that audience of Republicans was hostile. I won't name, I won't name their names, but I can remember their faces and I can remember their names. And I know the degree of hostility, and I know why they were hostile. I don't blame them. It's the second most hostile audience I've ever had. The, the worst one was when I tried to preach laissez-faire economics to the American Trucking Association, and they did not like that at all. <laughs> so that was my position. Uh, the Republican Party obviously didn't want to know what I was trying to tell them. But I knew what was going on in Vietnam, and I thought, well, this is ridiculous. We've got a bunch of elected officials here, and they're plain irresponsible. That was my interpretation. So the position last August was, I had very clear understanding, don't go down that road. So I sat down, I weighed up the situation, the pros and the cons, and I sat down, and national suicide was a, an, an, an idea this time last year. I hadn't even sat down to write it. I wrote uh, the book in three months. I had most of the information in my files. Arlington House accepted the book and sent me a check within 10 days, which is fantastic. Any author will tell you that. You just don't get books accepted that quickly. Arlington House moved with that thing. They had galley proofs out in 10 weeks. I had advanced copies by July. So I cannot fault in any way Arlington House. Now, what's in the book? If you want to pick up the rest of the Hoover story later, I rely on your questions. We can either forget it or you can pick it up. What's in the book? My theme is that 100,000 Americans and countless allies in Korea and Vietnam were killed by our own technology, nothing less. This technology was transferred to the Soviet Union under the guise of peaceful trade. I named some of the corporations, I'm naming some of the businessmen, but I would emphasize one thing. You cannot condemn American business on the basis of this book because 99% of American businessmen, I'm quite sure, do not know what is going on, and if they did, they would feel exactly as I do. Further, I think the book has nothing to do with partisan politics. It should be equally of interest to everyone, whether you're Republican, Democrat, uh, liberal, conservative. Come to that, it doesn't matter if you're American or Russian because to me it comes down to a plain question of individual rights versus the totalitarian state. So my appeal in National Suicide is to those who have open minds, who can judge facts for themselves. What I'm saying here, and this came about by accident, 
is what Andrei Zakharov, the uh, Soviet H-bomb scientist, said a few weeks ago, and the American press picked it up. Zakharov said, you are fools. Your trade is building up the Soviet Union. The Soviets are using it to build a bigger military establishment. Détente is a phony. He didn't use the word phony, but in effect he said that. I can't even think what, it's, what it would be in Russian right now, but still. What I'm saying here is, what, by accident, what I've got in here is the empirical backup to what a very brave Russian tried to tell the United States. And what happened? Read Mr. Kissinger on Andrei Zakharov. He's a Russian, and he'll pay for that. A Russian saying trade solves Soviet problems. We have no intellectual freedom in Russia. I'm going to end up in a mental institution because I said this. Even though I'm probably the best known physicist in the Soviet Union, certainly in the field of atomic energy, atomic weapons. What does Kissinger say? Ignore Zakharov. He mustn't interfere in Soviet internal affairs. We might disturb the Russians. It's an odd situation. A Russian warns the United States, and the United States ignores the warning. So let me very briefly tell you what I've got in the book. I hope it won't put you off reading it. I'll take that risk. First of all, I got a brief introduction, kind of a warming up thing. Oh, by the way, right in the preface, I, I say that why I've written the book, that I was denied the information from Department of Defense. And uh, consequently, we have censorship, and I point to Operation Keel Hall as another example of censorship. And that my hope is that the public reaction to this book is going to blast loose enough files for me to write the academic version. So in the first chapter, what I've, I've frankly got here, I've outlined the history of uh, so-called trade, what I call the détente aggression cycle. In other words, what the Soviets do, they, uh, they've, you can see this going back over 50 years. They are aggressive at one point, say, in Korea or Vietnam, and then they plead peace, and this détente phase is used to bring in more technology. And you can identify this. They, they act peacefully. They say, let's live in peace, détente. They did this in the early 30s. The United States goes in there, builds it up. The American taxpayer pays for it, two credits. Then they turn right around, and you get another war going. It's a cycle, and you can identify the cycle, and I've begun to identify it in this book. And then I talk about the persecution of Russian Jews, Russian Baptists, and Lithuanian Catholics. I'm neither a Jew nor a Baptist nor a Catholic. But these people have a right to live. They have a right to their religion, and I feel very deeply about their persecution. And so I have brought this in to show that if you think the Soviets have mellowed at all, then go and talk to some of these people. Then I've got uh, various sections on uh, the link between casualties and trade, which has not, uh, I think, been pointed out before. They say, as you trade, so there's a greater inclination to peace. Well, I've got a little diagram in here which says, the more you trade, the greater your casualties. The black, the black uh, marks are the increase in casualties, and there's a line showing the increase in trade. In other words, according to my analysis, the more you trade, the more casualties you get. But, of course, this is lost in, um, in, um, in Washington. Then in Chapter 4, we get right down to facts. How we built the Soviet military-industrial complex. Who built it? It's very interesting. Some companies are identified with this, some are not. I'd never heard the name General Motors linked with Soviet trade until Wall Street Journal last week. Apparently, they've finally given way. Up to now, the last 50 years has been Ford, a General Electric, um, a DuPont, Gleason, but not, up to now, General Motors, not Chrysler, not American Motors. International Harvester, yes. Caterpillar Tractor, no. Uh, Radio Corporation of America, RCA, yes. Uh, Hewlett Packard up to recently? No. Well, of course, it's a fairly recent company, but Bell Telephone certainly not. In other words, you can pinpoint specific companies and you can trace their association over 50 years. 